people. It's one of the best organised organisations I've had anything to do with ever. Uh, and so I'm uh, really very, very grateful. And it's, it's been a pleasure. So much so that I've now asked Lillian to do things like print my boarding card. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Those of you who are highly efficient, and I'm sure that's all of you, you know that if you are efficient, people ask you to do more things. So there's a lesson in life there. You, know, you don't want to be given the extra jobs to do. It's always the busy people that get given the extra jobs. The other thing is I want you to know I haven't got a nasty growth on my back. It's just, it's the microphone, okay? Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, I'm quite happy actually to have a mic because uh, my voice, I should probably be wearing a face mask. That's what they told me when I came in. If you've got a bit of a cold, wear a face mask. But uh, I'm not doing that, so just don't let me breathe on you. That's all I suggest. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. We're looking at developing critical literacy skills in the framework of, of two sets of activities uh, this morning. And this is what we're going to be doing. We've got two hours. First hour, depending a little bit on how long it takes, but the first hour we're going to be looking at reading, and I'm going to introduce you to um, a technique that's come out of general reading activities called academic reading circles. Not mine at all. Here is the author of it, Tyson Seaburn. Could only be American with a name like that. Um, and it, 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 it actually might be Canadian, but anyway. Really an interesting way of looking at reading, I think, in a systematic way. Um, and, and I'm going to get you to do it. We use it on our uh, in-sessional English language courses at Reading, so that's for students that are already on their academic programmes and are coming along for extra support, uh, or perhaps an integral part of their programmes in our business school, for example. And it's been found to be quite a good way of getting critically, quite quickly, into academic texts by giving students in groups different roles. And that's what you're going to experience today. I spent a little bit of time looking for a text to work with you on, and so many of the texts were so miserable. Uh, you know, the future of the planet, or how awful students are, or how we're all going to die of cancer. You know, I just thought, no, I, I, I have found something that could be used, so the text that you should all have uh, is a text. And it's, it's, it's vaguely optimistic. Um, and it is a text about plastics and how they can be recycled. And it's the kind of text that could be used on a module uh, in chemistry. So everybody should have a copy of this handout. And everybody should have a copy of the text. Everybody got those two things? Okay, right. And as it says on the handout, uh, this, is a, it's, it's, this is fictitious, but it's a recommended reading on a possible forthcoming module called Chemistry in the 21st Century, and it's uh, a week one topic on chemistry as global problem solver. So the idea is that it's on the science program, perhaps at undergraduate level. It's, uh, I'm not going to, you could probably work out quite quickly what, what genre it is, and that's part of what you're going to be asked to do. So, the technique called reading circles is what we're going to do first. And in the second hour, or however much time we have left, we're going to look a little bit at developing critical writing skills in terms of looking at some assignment tasks, some assignment rubrics, to, from different disciplines again. Uh, and different kinds of writing tasks. I, I don't know about you, but I'm, we're finding that our students are now being asked to do a whole range of different writing tasks than we used to have in the past. So gone are the days when everybody's doing a sort of expository essay. There's a lot more variety, and some of them parallel or mirror uh, professional writing tasks and, and they're coming into our classrooms. So uh, we're, having, we're, we're enjoying the challenge of working with students on those kind of writing tasks. So we're looking at two of those. But for the first hour we're going to be looking at reading. Any questions about that? Does it make sense? Okay, good. So, first part, academic reading circles. You've all got the text. And there are five roles, and in a moment I'm going to allocate you to a role. And then, one role will be leader, one role will be contextualizer. I'll go through in a moment and explain a bit of what each will do, and the handout explains that. Another will be connector, fourthly visualizer, and fifthly highlighter. And the highlighters get equipment. No expense spared. <laughs> so that's what's going to be happening, and you will be working. And this is all from, as I said, Tyson Seaburn's ideas. 
it, his, this model. There is the diagram of what it is. I will go through it in more detail, but the group leader is going to be... A, normally, what would happen is that these roles would be established before the class. The students would know what role they were going to have, and they would have prepared the text with their role in mind. Now, I wasn't able to give you homework. You're a very good group. I'm sure you would have done the homework mm -hmm. if I had been able to give it to you, but that's not what's happening today. So you're going to have to sort of imagine that you've had hours and hours with your bilingual dictionaries uh, and your detailed knowledge of chemistry to go through this text in more detail. Okay, but so I'd like you just to suspend that little bit of your, of your mind for now and, and pretend that that has happened. But you will have time to do some reading. In the, uh, you will need to read the text quite quickly in your, in your role. Groups. So we've got leaders. So if you feel you're a natural leader, you need to be number one when I come around and start allocating the numbers. Okay? If you're the bossy type, <laughs> number one is your role. Okay. Uh, then the visualizer, your role will be to organize key text concepts visually in various forms to see how the text to see the text concepts differently. So you'll be doing some visual work around the text. Uh, or looking at the visuals in the text and explaining them in some way. Um, anybody who's done chemistry at any part in their life, you probably would like to have that role because it would help for you to be able to explain the diagram on page two. Uh, connectors, you're going to be looking at subtle, the obvious or subtle uh, connections between the text concepts and other studies or real life. Okay. Um, Contextualizer also thinking about key contextual references that would help the reader of, of this text. And finally, the highlighter, you're going to be looking at lexical items in the text and or grammatical items that would help to improve comprehension for a second language reader. Okay, so those are the five different roles. You will all only experience one of those roles. And you will be responsible for that role for your group. So what's going to happen is, well, let's go through them again in a bit more detail. So, leaders, that's what you're going to do. You're going to situate the text, gauge the boot comprehension, and promote the discussion. So the leaders will be leading the discussion when we come back into our groups. Thinking about things like this. Who's the intended audience? What's the genre? What's going on in this text? What's the purpose of the text? Okay. Many years ago, we had a group of students from the Arab world, and one of my colleagues, Pauline Robinson, who, who was teaching them, and this has become a cliche in my group of, of colleagues, one of the students went up to her after the class and said, what is purpose? And what is purpose? And I think that's a really important question that all students should be. So what is purpose has now become quite an important phrase for me, and that is something you might like to be thinking about as the leader. What's the purpose of this text? Who's the audience? What's going on? And you might, if you've got your phones with you or access to the internet, just have a look if you can find out anything more about the organisation that printed the text or the author. Can you find out anything more online? Quickly, you won't have a lot of time. The uh, contextualisers, you're going to look at contextual references in the text, anything, any references to other organisations, any places, uh, outside references, there's anything like that. So you'll be looking through the text, trying to see are there external links, extrinsic links to things outside any real-life examples in the text. Um, connectors, you're going to be thinking about this text in terms of linking it to, to what goes on here in Hong Kong, people's lives, just trying to make links more generally um, to other modules, if, you, if you've ever done any science or if you think your students might have to other readings, real-world events, what's going on in the world at the moment. Think Great Barrier Reef, for example. Um, and personal experiences, so that's your role, to think about it from your own perspective. Visualizers, you're going to be looking at the diagrams in the text, but also thinking, is there any part of the text that you could put into a diagram? Could we do a flow chart, for example, if, if it had dates in it, which I, can't, I don't think it does, but could we do a timeline? How could this information be made visual in any way, or what can you do with the visuals in it? <laughs> and finally, the highlighters. What are you going to be looking at? What are highlighters focusing on? Lexical items, lexical items, and or particularly useful grammatical structures that you think students might find useful or challenging. But lexis is the main, is the main thing, vocabulary. So those are the five groups. Um, I don't like that word tonal language, because that means something completely different from me as an applied linguist, but it means stunts. You know, what's the position of the author here? Uh, and how is that got over? How is that presented? 
what's the unknown vocabulary that's key to the topic. Key to the topic, so you have to make those kinds of decisions uh, and looking at word families and also are there any topically related terms. Okay, this is why I've given you a text that's not just sort of, you know, life in the United Kingdom or, um, you know, something, but I've given you an actual text that could be used in, in a real ESP class or a chemistry class even. So here's the process. You're going to work in set roles to answer the role questions, okay? So each role, if you, let's just have a look at the leader one. Each role has got a page. I've, I've given you all the roles because I knew you'd want them to look at afterwards. What are you not going to do when I put you into your role sets? Read the other role. You're not, thank you, James. He's my you are not going to waste time reading the other roles. Okay? If I find you doing that, I will give you a detention. That will mean you cannot go to the Centennial Garden at lunchtime. You will have to stay here and do something unpleasant. Okay? So please, do not, don't look at the other one. You know how students do that? You give them something and they just, you know, they don't yeah. really want to do what you've asked them to do. So they either copy out the question, that's one strategy for wasting time, or they read through the rest of the text uh, because, you know, you've given it to them and, you know, it looks like they're busy. So I don't want any busy work, I want you on task. And I know you will be because you're very good teachers. Right, so each... Each of these sort of role cards has got information about the role, what the aims of the role are, and this is from um, Tyson Seaburn's book, mostly. Then there are some questions. I've been given each role questions. In real life, the students would be coming up with the questions themselves, but we have to cut to the chase. Um, so I'm asking, I'll give you some questions, and then when you come back into the groups, that's what you have to do. That will be your role when you come back into the groups. Is that clear, class? Yes. <laughs> So, that's what you're going to do. Then, you, then, having done that, I'll give you about 15 to 20 minutes to do that, then you'll come back in here, and in each, there will be one person from each role in each group, and then you will have a discussion around the text with each person with their role chipping in, adding to it. But who's going to lead the discussion? The leader. Okay, the leader's going to lead the discussion, but everybody will chip in. So the visualizers might say, oh, here's something. The, the connectors might say, well, I've really thought about this. The highlighters might say, well, there's a really interesting area of vocabulary here that we don't understand or that we need to work on. I want you to be students here, not teachers, please. You're students. This is a simulation, if you like. Um, and at the end, there'll be some time to reflect on the process, whether this, how useful or not this would be for your students. So that is what we are doing. Okay, and that's what we're going to do afterwards. Are there any questions? Good, I like that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to come around now. I'm going to give you a number and a role. Okay, so if I say, so you, you lot are all going to be group A, for example. Okay, so. But if you think you want to be the leader, because you're bossy, um, <laughs> But actually, what would we, in class, you'd have different students, you would have different students playing different roles with different texts, so it wouldn't be the same every time. Okay, so I'm going to come around now very quickly, and then I'm going to say all the ones go next door, all the twos go there. All the threes go there, all the fours there, and all the fives there, something like that. I'm going to ask you then to, so you do need to remember the letter, which is your group name, and the number, which is your role name. I love doing things like this with teachers, because they quite often get it completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the students are more biddable. The teachers get it completely wrong because they stop listening, you know, or they think, okay, so right, I'm coming round, I'm coming round, okay? Okay, so, A1, do you think you'd be able to lead it? A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, okay? B1. <laughs> Okay. 
you had the easiest job in a way. How easy was it to do? You had to make the links between this whole topic and your own lives and, and Hong Kong and what was going on in Hong Kong. How easy was that to do? Yeah, pretty easy. Did people go beyond Hong Kong? <laughs> you were talking about. Yes. So what other contexts did you talk about? Um, other recycling situations in other places in the world. Other countries, yeah. Germany, yeah. Germany yeah. okay, yeah. for example. Yeah. And the need to use plastic generally, you know, we were talking about. So. Yeah, okay, okay. And is, is plastic a concern in, in Hong Kong? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so does plastic recycle separately? No, no, it's not really recycled okay. at all. So, yeah, not recycled at all. Well, very little. <laughs> the picture visualises that picture at the beginning. Anybody know what that is? Did you work out what that might be? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. That picture visualises. Did you work out what that picture might be? I think these are where they're doing building blocks made out of plastic. It looks to me like they're all being sort of strapped, so they've been squished and strapped together. There are some parts of the world that are used, I think South America, Brazil, using plastic uh, to make building blocks for things like seats and in parks um, and things like that. So again, that's something, I'm not gonna, we're not going to talk about it now, but that's the kind of thing that you might, if you researched it more and had the time to do that. Okay, so connectors, think about real world events, personalising it, how it works for you. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, but also beyond that. Visualizers, any comments? <laughs> Everybody have a look at the visualizer role, what it was they were being asked to do. Did you, did you manage to produce a flow chart, visualizers? <laughs> oh, I see somebody had a flow chart. We were just halfway through it. Yes. Right. Well, because we were quite sure about, you know, so how it all started. So with ordinary plastic. And then, you know, so the next step would be to go through a process, which is called reverse polymerization. Yes, yes. Yeah. Reverse polymerization. Who knew? <laughs> yes. Which breaks down polymer yes. into monomer. Yes. And which is what is shown in the, in the second diagram. picture. Yes. Okay, okay. So, and, and did, it, did you, you didn't have time really, but did you find any other graphics or diagrams or anything that could have been added to this, that you could have added, supplemented? Where would you look if you wanted some more visuals? And visuals, remember, don't have to be photographs. Could have been graphs, diagrams. Where could you look? Which one? Yeah. Maybe at the end of the first page, we can put a flowchart like this one to explain what has been said. Okay. Yes, yeah, because it's quite a difficult text. So a, yeah, a flowchart might help to show actually what's going on in the text. And you can, if you, if students could go beyond to find things from organisations like Greenpeace or, or organisations that are talking about recycling um, and, and bring in perhaps data about the increase in plastic. How the, the ocean, what's the size of the plastic uh, cover of the ocean? I think it's the size of Africa or something, you know, people might be able to go online and find some extra visuals that would help. Uh, the first picture, I'm still puzzled. Is it really the PDK, or is it just showing that um, it will, it's like the it's like about the zero waste recycling yeah. process that is described? I've got no idea. That's, what, that's <laughs> the process. So that's something for students to think. That's a, it's it's a yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. 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 in the end, you have like a like a like a prototype. It's not even yeah. like it's only the concept yeah. Yeah. part here. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's misleading, isn't it? Oh, well, that's something to talk about. <laughs> okay, okay. So the visualizers have, didn't have particularly helpful visuals here, but certainly in other contexts you could have graphs, diagrams, charts, things like that, which would bring in all the language associated with increase, decrease, percentage, you know, statistical discussion. Um, and finally, last but not least, the highlighters, in some ways, some ways, you had the second easiest role, I think, I think. Uh, but maybe not. What kind of uh, linguistic things were you finding in the text? What were you focusing on? What kind of areas? Difficult words. Difficu difficult <laughs> words. Okay. But there weren't that many. I mean, it's not academic. It's not a deeply academic text. No, it's back to the audience. Who's, the, who's it aimed at? Yes, it's the general scientific interest. Was there any sub-technical language? Did you pick out any sub-technical language? Lots of recycling vocabulary. Yes. Okay, so a lot of vocabulary around recycling. Yeah. 
words like revamped. I quite like that word on, on page two, three paragraphs up. They're like downcycling. Sorry? Downcycling. Downcycling. Down it's upcycling, downcycling. Yes, yes. Virgin Sorry. Virgin. Virgin plastic, yes. <laughs> Who knew? Um, okay, so uh, what, did you find any grammatical things of interest? Sorry? Hedging. Hedging. Yeah. Yes, and why is hedging so important here? Why is hedging contextualizers? Why is hedging so important here? Oh, because she's she's kind of copying. She doesn't have proof yeah. herself. Yes, this is early days. Yeah. This is early days. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's just happened. What's the date? When was the press release? May 11th. May 11th. Okay, so this is really hot off the press. You heard it here first. Sorry, March of May 6th. Sorry, May 6th. Okay, so you know she's hedging because we don't know, but it looks. It sounds promising, and that's why it's being shared. Okay, so that's, I'm going to stop there in terms of talking about this text and talking about those roles. Any, any um, quick reflections before we move on to the next? Any reflections on that process? Do you think this would work with an academic text, or have you ever tried it? It's like a journal article, yes, for example. Yes, 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 we do. I mean, the problem is, I've thought about that. Journal articles, how long? I, you'd be amazed. I spent quite a lot of time looking for a short journal article. And the only ones that are really short are book reviews, quite frankly. And I thought, well, you didn't want to read chapter one is this, chapter two is that, chapter two. So um, it, it's quite hard to find something that's short. But yes, we do do them. We, we, yeah, with master students, for example, on our M MBAs, we, they, they get a whole article, and they get, you know, two weeks to do it. So you're the contextualizer for this article, 20 pages, and it's assumed when you come to the class, you know, everybody's read it, and of course they have to read it, because they're going to be in a group, and the leader's going to be saying, right, you're the connector, what is it that you found out, you're the highlighter, what you, you know, so if you don't do your, your role, um, you've let the group down. So, so it's, it's a, and, and then the important thing is to change the roles so that everybody gets a go at being the highlights of the contextualizer, so that they then know what that role is, and they can say, right, okay, tell me about the language, you look at the language, what did you notice, and what's the vocabulary uh, domain is here, that kind of thing. So, I think it's got, uh, well, sorry, what do you think? What do you think about that? Jay? I think as a default, obviously, depending on your classroom, they should be using the digital copy of the article. Yes. And then you have paper in case some people yes. can come in. Because the links within the digital copy are yeah. important, and you don't mm. see them here. That's the right. Hyper -links. Yes. Mm. Yes. How many of you actually did find the article? You found it, didn't you? Yes. yes. So, in it, so in each group, was there almost was there somebody who found it? Because, and again, you know, that's what I would expect. Uh, and again, for students doing it outside class with a couple of weeks' notice, then they would be online, and they'd be using the journal article from the online resource. Mm. But that's a good point. Yes. Any other comments or? The role of the highlighter, I mean, to what extent would level of proficiency, I mean, low level students could Well, what do you think? It's a good, you know, what would be, how would low level students, they'll, they'll pick up different things. They will pick up different things. Yeah. I mean, with a more advanced level group, with a more advanced level, you could ask them to look at this article and a scientific article, because there is a scientific article that will come out of this, and then you could ask them to compare the language, because there is not this is not academic language here. Things like page two, three paragraphs, up, all that being said, you'd never have that to go up. So you could ask you know, a more advanced level group, I know you're not asking about a more advanced level group, but you could ask them to compare this with the actual article that comes out. A lower level group, you would ask them perhaps to be looking at things like the nouns. You would just say, look, find all the nouns that look like they've got something to do with recycling. Yes. Or any words that have got mer, polymer in them, or something, you know, or plastic in them, or cycle. So that's the, the highlighter, just go through and look all the words with cycle, or, or polymer, or plastic in them, and, and work around that. Because you have, what was it? Uh, Monopolymerization or something. <laughs> and then what's the, what's the difference between a polymer and polymerization? So I think you could, uh, it, it, uh, but you could ask, should low-level students be reading this at all? You know, I mean, you have to have the right, you choose the text for your class depending on what you want them to do. But it's a really important point, yeah. Good. Any other, any other comments? Alison? I was just going to ask, have you ever used it to have the students evaluate the writing style? Ah. The writer, mm -hmm. to critique it? Well, you could, 
you could, we, I mean, I haven't ever used it for that, because it's usually, it's trying to get a comprehension and, and giving students a way in. Because very often, if students are reading in a foreign language, they're not doing things like making the connections with their own experience. They're not looking at the visuals enough. Um, and they're not looking at the links. And, and certainly some of our students would struggle to say who is, who, they wouldn't necessarily think about the relationship between Sophie Hirsch and the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. And that's quite an important distinction here because Sophie Hirsch is not a representative of the World Economic Forum. She's been given this site where she's posted, but she's not representing them. So that's sort of what's the status? What is the status? Who do we think she is? Do we find out who she is? She's a freelance journalist, but she's written for fashion magazines, travel magazines, teen magazines. Okay. So she's, 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 she's does reaching out is Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we felt that was a bit of a weakness, actually. I mean, there was a yeah. thing with education and science journalists and yeah. Perhaps she's a, she's a case in point. Yeah. She can't write so critically on it because she doesn't have the background. She doesn't have yeah. the background. Yeah. So you could say, right, you're a, sci you're a chemistry major. I want you to write the article that Sophie would have written had she been a chemist. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, and then they can do it with more authenticity. Okay? But, but it's a way in. It's a way in. It's giving them the topic. Okay. okay, so any other comments on, on this as a process? This, these five different roles. Did you all have enough to talk about? Leaders, how easy did you find it to do? You were good leaders, all of you. Possible exception of Ben. Um, <laughs> well, good leaders usually shift the blame on that. Yes, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you were <laughs> allowed to do that. I think that the most difficulty is that you know you try to facilitate a discussion and it's to cut people off is actually very rude. I mean, I don't like that. Yes, that's why it's important to change the roles because then actually it's only when you've been a leader yourself that you realise how you want to support the leader and how you need to, and how when you've been um, the the the, the contextualiser, how important it is to when to chip in and how to do it. And of course, people have that have those roles. But I so is it something you might use with your students? Okay, I think I think it's worth thinking about. As I say, the commercial break. The book is available. It's available as a website. It's available. It's available as a book. I think it's quite. It's a. It's something you'd have to invest time in. You couldn't just do it as a one-off. I think you would have to build up student skills in these areas. But what you want is students who then pick up articles from journals and look at the vocabulary, look at the, the visuals, look at the context, see who the author is, look at the links, and then try and visualize, to make, to make uh, diagrams to represent the information. So it's quite, it's quite a, a, an all encompassing. Is anything missing? Were there any roles we should have had that we didn't have? We could, any roles we didn't have? Well, Sorry? Someone should take notes. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so there's nobody in the group was sort of reporting the discussion. I just let you get on with it, really. You could, you could, I did, you did have questions. The leaders did have questions to go through. But um, you could, you could do, you could make that more formal. Yeah? Anybody else? Anything well, else? Perhaps something more of a task focus to, to Some, work to woods, you know. So a writing task that's got to come out of it. Something like that, yes. Yeah. 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 The notes yes, this is. You have to circulate the notes to everybody yeah. for use for that. For yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. I think you would want to spend longer perhaps pulling it together. Or not, it would depend upon what, what you wanted to do next and how much time you had for this in your curriculum. But you could certainly use online resources, discussion boards, for people to post their notes or to post their, 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 the work that they've done within their group. Okay, enough on that. Thank you. Thank you for doing that so collaboratively as well. Let's move on now, which is uh, to the second half, which is we're going to be looking at two undergraduate modules. Thank you. Yeah, so that everybody needs one of those. And one of those. Thing called document one. I've given you two assignments that my colleagues gave me. I'm not making any comment about them as the quality of them as assignments. Um, one is from an economics undergraduate module, part two. They're all for second year undergraduate students in our university. Uh, and it's from a module on social policy. So we're on the yellow document. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, and there's the assignment. I'm not going to say any more about it for the moment. The assignment begins with the word hello. My husband's helped me with this document. He kept trying to take hello away. He said, no, no, leaving hello. So hello is that. But it's not from the last really back there. Okay, so, and then on the back side, as my students would call it, there is um, the second one, which is from computer science. And this is a task in computer science on neural networks. You're having a good day today uh, in terms of your exposure to science. Okay? And what I would like you to do, please, is I'm going to give you, and you don't have to stay in this room because it's a, if you want to go and work on one of the tables uh, next door, but I'm only going to give you about 10 minutes for this. Um, I want you to look through and complete the table for both, going down to number four. Okay? So that both of those two tasks, those two assignments, I'd like you to decide what's the topic area. Well, I've already told you what the topic area is, so we've done one. What's the genre that the students are being asked to write? What, is there anything specific the students need to note? So you could, if you want to, you can steal a highlighter pen and just highlight it on the, on the assignment sheet, or you can put a little footnote there. And then I'd just like you to think, what might the marking criteria be? What do you think would be the marking criteria for this piece of work? Remember, they're second year, they're undergraduate students, not final year. Okay, any questions about that? Because then I'm going to show you the actual marking criteria and get you to see if there's any similarities or differences. Um, and then we're going to think about what challenges there might be for your students. That's, that's what we're doing. James, yeah? It's an EAP class. No. Oh. No, no, no. Well, you're, well, you could be doing it in an EAP class. Right. If you were, but these are genuine tasks that students have been given to do in economics in and economics. in computer oh, right, science. Right. But we have international students in the economics classes, yeah, yeah. Uh, not native speakers of English, in the economic classes and in the computer science. So you're running a parallel, good question, you're running a parallel in-sessional English. You're helping these students to, uh, that's what you're going to be doing, is to, to break down the task. But I also want you to be thinking about these because I think these are the kinds of tasks that universities are now using increasingly. And I thought you might be interested just in, in having a look at that. I'm sure it's the same here in Hong Kong. So 10 minutes uh, to do questions one, two, three, and four for coursework one, um, social policy and coursework to neural networks. Okay, off you go. Ten minutes. Coursework one, Prime, Prime in the UK. Uh, in the 19th century? No, no. Right. Right. since when? Right. Yes, in the last uh, 10, 10, 15 years. Okay, that's what the, the topic area is. What's the genre? Notes. Notes for who? Summary notes for who? For a minister. For a minister. For somebody else who is not an expert. Okay, so it's summary notes. And what should the notes look like? So that's what the genre is, summary notes, bullet points. But it's not just summary notes, is it? Yeah. You've also got to give a bit of a commentary, and you've got to give, what have you got to give under 2-2? Two, two? Opinion. Opinion. You've got to give your opinion because you are the expert. <coughs> All right? And this is, what, this is what young researchers have to do when they get a job in Parliament. They've got to get the information very quickly to give to the Minister tomorrow for a press release or for questions in the House. It's, 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 it, I think it's a really interesting task, but it's a very challenging task because it's a very unfamiliar task, okay? So anything specific the students need to note <laughs> in doing this? Uh, before and after. So it's for the last 20 years, Yes. but kind of distinguishing before 2010 and after 2010 okay. and comparing. Yes, so there is a comparison. A, they've got to get the time zone right mm -hmm. and they've got to see what the comparison is across the time zone. So they have to note that. What else do they have to note, Jay? I think the formatting is very important. Because even though it says bullet points, the minister has to be able to access the information. Yes, quickly, it's got to be easily. Yeah. So the minister's going to be standing there. Somebody from the opposition, pretty useless, so they probably won't do much. <laughs> somebody from the opposition is going to say, "Is it true that 
The re offending in the United Kingdom has increased by 19 cents since this present government took control. The answer is yes. Um, but, um, and, then, and then the minister is just going to glance down and say, well, actually, in 2017, recidivism was dropped by, you know, so, so it's got to be really clearly laid out. So not just bullet points, but highlighted. And, Which and is clear. a challenge, because they have maybe not, are not familiar with the genre. Yes. Well, there is. This format, yeah. this yes. kind of thing. It's a, it's a difficult genre. And also the opinion bit. What's going to happen to you if you get the opinion wrong? Yeah. If your facts are wrong, what's going to happen to you? You're a young researcher hoping to have a great career as a civil servant. What will happen if you get that wrong? That's it. You're out. That's your, that you, you, know, you have to become a teacher. There's no... <laughs> 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 a career as, as a policy researcher. And I'm not saying the teachers... <laughs> Okay, so marking criteria. What did, what did you come up with for, for marking criteria? Clarity. Clarity. Accuracy. Length. 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 What did you say? Conciseness. Okay. Language. Language. The language has to be, yes, and you might need to hedge. You know, you can't just, but you, with statistics, you need to be right. But we talked about statistics yesterday, you know, about, about what you say. So you're going to have to be very careful about what you say about the statistics that you're presenting. It could be, it seems that a trend is an increasing trend, but it, it's got to be clear and it's got to be accurate. Okay. Any other criteria? Organization. Yes. Yeah, the headings. Jay's point. Yeah, needs to be clearly laid out. Application of economic principles to the market model. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And remember, there's, there's some little hints. I think it's really mean when people put hints in brackets in italics. But, you, know, yeah. you see that bit down here and towards the bottom of the bottom. Yeah. Hint. Use the market model of crime discussed in the lecture. So there's a little hint there. So we've got to draw on. Okay. Um, and all, yes, use of sources. And let's go back to 2-2. Two, two. That's really quite important. 2-2. Two, two. If reoffending rates don't account for the recent falls in crime, they might. Then what is the most likely explanation, in your opinion? How many explanations? One. 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 Most likely explanation. That's really important. Okay, I bet a lot of students. Well, you're going to see in a moment. Okay, I'm going to, would you like to see... Well, I don't care whether you'd like to see it again. <laughs> I'm going to give you now a green document which has the marking criteria on it, okay? And it's a bit unusual. It's quite interesting. I, had, I got in touch with the academic who produced this because I think uh, it's unethical to take people's work without their permission. So I got in touch with him uh, and said, would you mind very much... Good Hong Kong. Uh, would you mind very much if I took your assignment and your marking criteria and your feedback? <laughs> and you got in touch with it. Well, I'll tell you what he said after. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So this is, if you just look on the first page, have a look, and I'd like you to look at his marking criteria and yours. I think his marking criteria is a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what it is at the moment. So could you now do task sheet question five? Task sheet question five. Differences in the marking criteria that you came up with, or we talked about just now. Okay, let's, let's just put this together. It is a slightly odd set of criteria, um, because he hasn't really, well, what has he not done? How has he divided them up? No, you're just by task, really. So you've got the first half, for which you get 60% of the mark, and the second half, for which you get 20 and 20% 20 of the mark. So, so just by waiting, really. But let's, let's park that for the moment. Let's ignore that. Um, what about the criteria, the things that he has picked out? Are they the things that you've picked out in your criteria? So in your answer to um, number four... Are there any differences between you, the marking criteria that you predicted and the marking criteria that, that he's got? Mm -hmm. well, his is much more 
Okay, much more emphasis on, on the content, on the well, statistics. We have been looking at language and okay. style quite a lot. Okay. And structure. Yeah. And organization. Yeah. Okay. But he has got, and if we look at it, we have got formatting. So Jay's yeah, point. Formatting. Following instructions carefully. And the moment I'm going to show you the generic feedback that he gave the group. And you will see that was one of the issues. Because there's quite a lot of very specific instructions here, like that bit about only giving one opinion. Okay, they're only allowed to give one opinion um, in 2-2, two, two, for example. Okay, so they've got to follow instructions carefully, and so that's something we need to work with our students on, highlighting what the instructions are in a, in a, in a rubric, especially when it's as complicated. And increasingly, I don't know about you, but I find now rubrics are getting really complicated. Gone are the days where it's write an essay on. <laughs> uh, that's gone. It's now do this, do that, do a bit of the other, uh, remember to do this, read the following. I mean, because for example, here at the bottom, P.S. I love that. <laughs> P.S. The following data sources might be helpful. I have students who, if it says might be helpful, think it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to look at it. It's just might. You know? Well, actually, if, I, if, I, if the tutor says it might be helpful, you better, you better look at it. Natasha. It was interesting that there's also a comment that if you find alternative sources yeah. of information, yeah. that would be like a big bonus. Yes, yes, that's the underweight 60% yes. the first bit, the bottom bullet there, quoting reliable statistics. What's a reliable statistic? Yeah. Reliable statistics from alternative sources. And what were you saying about that? Not from oh, just that our students would never think to look for alternatives. If, if, if those were given at the bottom of the page, then you go, okay, I'll go to those. And then they certainly wouldn't be looking for statistics that might contradict yeah. what's been given. Yeah. Um, but if, so I wonder, though, as, as if I was an economics or, or a political science type student, whether that would have been indoctrinated, indoctrinated yes. into me. Yes, we're back to critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, what does it mean to be a critical thinker in economics when you're working with statistics? Okay. And, and what does it mean? Do you take the government statistics as the truth? Where, or do you look where at, in other places? And if so, where else? Where else? So that, that's really, presumably that would be part of the course. But if I was working with international students on, on this, I'd be wanting to find out from the tutor, where else would you expect them to look? You need to give them a bit more guidance. Or have you given them guidance already? Okay, uh, any other? So, following instructions, good choice of statistics, focus on trends and changes rather than levels. So this is your point about before, and you know the trends, the changes, not just statement of what it is. So the language all around increase, decrease, increase a lot, decrease a little, etc., etc. Upward trends, downward trends. Um, okay. That third bullet point is content. That's quite challenging. But that's really important coming in, in Britain at the moment. Trends and how people are affected. Okay. So impact. Uh, and the next one, that point, you know, your bullet points, what are you going to say in your bullet points? The next one, understanding of how statistics can be mi misrepresented. Okay. Or selected, level versus rate, etc., etc., etc. And then the points about two, uh, under two. Same as above, but you have to be selective. And two, two, you've got to have some theory in there. Because that's why you're an expert. That's why you've been asked to do this. Then we're saying, who are these students? They're the middle year of a three-year program. So next year, they'll be finalists. They're the middle year. So I think they would be equivalent to your year three. Uh, and you have to have a convincing argument with clear reasons for choice and factual evidence. OK, I'm gonna, we haven't got a lot of time, but I, I thought you might like to see the generic feedback. The students got individual feedback, thank you, but they all have a look at this and see the things he commented on. As I say, he gave me permission to use these. I'm going to copy with him when I get back. He said to me, oh Claire, I'm so pleased you like my rubric. Um, <laughs> changing it to make it more, you know, by, by, by criteria. And I think perhaps you should do that. <laughs> I will give it to her so that you will hate you. Okay, have a look. Have a look. We're going to finish in about five minutes, but have a, or less. Have a, have a, just have a quick look. 
This is genuine. This is horse from the horse's mouth. She was marked anonymously, so he didn't know who the students were, but they would have had individual feedback on their individual scripts. So this is through Turnitin online. And this is the generic feedback for the whole thing. <laughs> And most of the students are home students. There's not many international students in this group. Most of them are home students. So we do have some fantastic Chinese students coming in from Korea. Hey, smart one A. One and two A. Any comments on that? I mean, were there any surprises there? Was it pretty much what you'd identified as being the important things? Formatting is there. Instructions. They didn't follow the instructions. So that's a really and one question I would put to you is, what should be done with this general feedback for next year's students? They should have this feedback as they start out on the task. And that's, that's what I should be saying to him, make sure you give this next year. And that's what we should all be doing. <laughs> Contrasting data sources, percentage changes, so language is important there, rates is important, x to y is important, again language is going to come into all of these, how clearly they explain it. And wider research, we talked about that earlier, it wasn't essential, but it was helpful. Subheadings, your point about making sure the bullet points are really clear. And the point about key messages, ministers like key messages, sort of what's the, what's the headline? What's the headline, okay, that you can get from that? Now let's look very quickly at part 2b. What do you think about that opening paragraph? What did he say there that might be surprising to students? Technical language. Yes, no, 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 the first part, the first paragraph, Natasha. For any of the opinions. Yes, he wrong, he didn't. He didn't mark the opinions. He didn't mark the opinions. He was just looking at evidence, evidence yeah. and whether they made general economic quality and sociological sense. So the quality of the evidence. That's going to make a lot of students very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I think. There isn't a right answer. We're back to what we were talking. I was talking about yesterday at the plenary. There isn't, a, and he's not actually looking for a right answer. Quite extraordinary, I think. Um, but then, and then Natasha's point. Then he moves on to technical language. That's interesting because again, students are writing for display. They want to display their knowledge. They want to display. But they've forgotten, what have they forgotten when they when they show off by talking about the audience? The audience. They've forgotten the audience. And that's, you know, he talks about it being over the top. You know, pretty damn it. So poor students, they spend all this time learning this language and getting the, the context and, and, and the concepts. And suddenly they've got to throw them out the window and present it for a lay audience. Okay, next one. All around evidence. And of course, that's where critical thinking is absolutely crucial. What's appropriate evidence? What's the right evidence? And he was looking for statistical sources of evidence in particular, and specific empirical results from the academic literature. So this, this involved reading, it involved researching. And then the final thing, the thing we say to our students all the time, what do you have to do? Answer the, Answer the question. You were asked for the most likely explanation. And look at that next sentence, isn't that harsh? Several of you deviated from this to waste space, explaining the market model of crime, or weighing up pros and cons of various other potential explanations. I was looking for a further start. <laughs> okay, so, actually from an EAP teacher's point of view, this is gold. This is gold. You know, this is the kind of stuff that it's really hard for EAP teachers to get their hands on, but it's the kind of things we need to get our hands on, because we can work, this could be a text, a reading text. You could have students looking at this from the connector, the contextualizer, the leader, uh, not sure about the visualizer. Well, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, you could have them doing that. You could have them looking at taking that and that and a sample that a student had produced. They could be doing that and then working on it together. Okay, I hope that was 
useful and interesting. Um, I will have a conversation with him about his rubric, because I think there are some problems with it. Uh, but it's an interesting task. We don't have time to go through neural networks, but I, if you, uh, you can do this in the privacy of your own home. Uh, the neural, and I didn't have general feedback. I thought the social policy was more interesting. Yeah. We're going to stop there, and I'm sorry, we've got about two minutes for you to do the feedback. You have to do the feedback before you go. Thank you very much. Thanks for being such a good